Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I used to work for a guy in New York called Charles Lieber who said, we don't count heads, we weigh them. So I think it's, uh, I think that's the best spin I can actually put on the audience this afternoon, I guess right across the workshops, but still. Uh, welcome. Um, my name's Jeremy Wilson, I'm from Sydney, Australia. And this is our opera house that needs no introduction. Um, every year we have something called a vivid uh, exposition where we shine lights, coloured lights on our public buildings. And this is an example of last year. I, uh, I w work at the University of New South Wales where I'm Professor of Medicine. And I'm based at Liverpool Hospital in Sydney, which is the um, largest hospital in the country and the second oldest hospital in the country. It was actually, it dates back to 1813, the time of Napoleon. Um, I'm really pleased to be here to tell you about uh, our work that we've been doing in the pancreas. And I was hoping to use this talk this afternoon to actually illustrate how basic science research can actually translate, albeit slowly, into clinical, um, clinical advances. So I think it's uh, important for you to realise right up, I'm not going to be able to give you the magic cure for pancreatic disease as the basis of this, but just try and illustrate for you how the field is moving. Um, in at least one direction. So can I ask what disciplines you're all from? Are you all clinicians? See, all see patients? Anybody who not see, doesn't see patients? Medical students. Excellent. So you've got a completely unformed mind and you're ready to listen and believe everything you're told. <laughs> it's very... <laughs> Our medical students are, are like that on about the, for the first week. They, they're the sweetest, nicest people. And then after that, they change. They become cynical. They don't listen to anything. They don't pay attention. So um, we have approximately 1,500 medical students in our system at any one time. So I try and teach them in their foundations course right at the beginning of the course because then they are really sweet and they believe everything I say and they're polite. And they, they rapidly stop being like that in Australia anyway. Okay. So. Um, we were the first group in the world to isolate pancreatic stellate cells. And I'll go on to explain to you what they are. In the, in the space of about the next uh, hour or so, please feel free to interrupt at any time. As I said, we were the first to isolate the pancreatic stellate cells and that happened in 1998. And since that time, there has been an almost exponential increase in the interest of stellate cells throughout the world, so that currently, every year, about 170, 160 to 170 papers are actually published on the subject. So our discovery or our isolation um, at least aroused a lot of interest. Please feel free if you want to, just to interrupt at any time. Um, what else do I need to say about? Uh, as I said, we were the first in the world, but we were the first only by two weeks. There were three groups working in the world on trying to isolate these cells. Ours was one of them. There was a group in England, in the UK, in Southampton, and there was a group in Germany, in Ulm. And we beat the Germans by two weeks. We submitted our publication to gastroenterology, um, and uh, it was rejected and it was in the days, 1998 was in the days where 
he got paper rejection, it wasn't electronic, but the editor had actually sort of taken a text of colour and blacked out all the things he didn't want us to read. So he held it up to the light and tried to read through what they'd censored, and it just appeared that the reviewers didn't believe our work, just didn't believe it. We knew that there were other people interested in the field, so we turned it around. I think we got the rejection one day, and we sent the manuscript off again the following day, straight away, to GUT this time. And fortunately, the editor of GUT at that time, or the, the sub-editor, was a, was a liver stellate cell guy, and he believed us, and he had the, um, he had the unfortunate um, experience of having to w walk down uh, the corridor of his building to tell the lab in his building that was working on the same, the same thing, isolating pancreatic stellate cells, that an Australian group had beaten them to it. Particularly galling for the English it is to be beaten at anything by Australians. So uh, there were memorable days, but the people who actually did the research, both in Germany and in the UK, have become our dearest friends and collaborators since then. Now, we were interested in pancreatic fibrosis. Um, it's a characteristic feature both of pancreatic cancer and chronic pancreatitis. But most people up and you know in the 90s thought that it was a pretty inert process, that once you got fibrosis, you got scar tissue, that was the end of the story. There wasn't any point in sort of studying it. It was thought to be a relatively inert pathological feature of disease. And mind you, it was actually the people who were engaged in the field uh, to my mind anyway, seemed particularly inert and not very exciting themselves. So um, that happened be as it may. Uh, this is a diagram showing pancreatic fibrosis in chronic pancreatitis. Pancreatic tissue has been replaced by these broad bands of fibrous tissue, islets of remaining acinar tissue here. And looking remarkably similar is pancreatic cancer. Um, these are islets of islands of cancer cells surrounded by this thick uh, desmoplastic reaction. And in fact, sometimes when I've looked down the microscope and looked at a, at a, a section of pancreatic cancer, um, I thought, where are the cancer cells? They're not there. It's all just dense fibrous tissue. And yet this element of pancreatic cancer has been largely um, ignored up until recently. People have concentrated all their efforts on the cancer cells themselves and all their efforts trying to find out what kills cancer cells in the test tube hasn't related to anything to do with a cure or even a, you know, a good remission in patients with pancreatic cancer. So fibrogenesis, I'm doing something wrong here, hang on, I'm making that noise. Fibrogenesis is not an inert static process, it's a dynamic process, um, active dynamic process, and it's reversible in the early stages. I mean, the most dramatic uh, examples of how reversible fibrosis is comes from the hepatitis trials where you have liver fibrosis uh, in patients with hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And in some instances, the liver can return from a cirrhotic picture to be completely normal histologically with the treatment of the, of the virus. So it is reversible. Is it always reversible? Well, no, I think there must be a no, a point beyond which the fibrosis and the scarring and the deformity of the gland, the pancreas, becomes such, or the liver, that it's, you cannot actually restore the entire organ to normal. Um, so an understanding of the early events has the potential for identifying therapeutic targets to prevent or slow the progression of fibrosis. Um, 
and the central because of our work and other work, other people, the central role of the pancreatic stellate cell in pancreatic fibrosis is now well acknowledged. What I want to give you this afternoon is a brief historical perspective. Just tell you how we isolated and how other people isolate pancreatic stellate cells. Briefly dwell on what pancreatic stellate cells do in health in normal individuals and what we think they do in, in pancreatic cancer. And then finally look at, if you like, in the translation aspect of the talk, look how we're using our knowledge about pancreatic cell biology to develop treatments for pancreatic cancer. Now, stellate cells were first described, I'm echoing badly here, I don't know how to stop this. Can you, I'm just, maybe you can, I can stop the wax in my ear or the, my neck, is it my neck? but all right, that's fine. Make cuts down the noise. Now, the, the great pathologist, uh, German pathologist Kupfer, von Kupfer, uh, first described stellate cells in 1876 in the liver. And he called them Sternzellen, which is German for stellate cell. And these he described as star-shaped cells, cells scattered in liver lobules in a perisinusoidal location. Um, and uh, he identified them in the liver of a variety of species, including human liver. But he recanted. He described them in 1876. And then in 1898, that's 22 years later, at an anatomic congress, an anatomy congress in, in Kiel, in Germany, he said, I was wrong. These are Kupfer cells. They're not different from, from Kupfer cells. And he actually held up the field for decades. Because being a great man, everybody believes what great men say people stop even investigating whether there are stellate cells. So that's a lesson for medical students. And it took until 1971, 73 years later, before a Japanese researcher said, no, stellate cells are different. So he held it up for almost uh, a century. Um, this uh, Japanese researcher, Waki, in, uh, reported um, star-shaped cells that, that stained positive for gold that were located in a perisinusoidal uh, position around the space of dis, and which stained positive for vitamin A. Well, they fluoresced as though they contained vitamin A. So um, he went on to say that these were resident cells they're containing vit vitamin A droplets, and uh, they, sorry, you know, this is what's known about hepatic stellate cells at the moment, not what Waki described. These are resonant liver cells located in the perisinusoidal sinus space of dis. They contain vitamin A droplets, and they stain positively for desmin and glial fibrillary acidic protein, both of which are, are called stellate cell selective markers. And here's a diagram provided to me by Scott Friedman, who's the doyen of uh, liver fibrosis in, from New York, showing the, uh, a picture of the uh, sinusoid with the star-shaped cell wrapped around the outside of it with Kupfer cells, the phagocytic cells, on the inside. Now, we're still on liver at the moment because most of the early work was done on liver. Um, when activated, the hepatic stellate cells lose their vitamin A droplets. Nobody knows why. These are the principal source of vitamin A storage in, um, in the body, mainly in the liver, but also in the pancreas. And when they lose vitamin A, they become activated, 
when they become loaded with vitamin A, which you can do, uh, they become quiescent. They go to sleep again. Nobody knows the mechanisms. But when they're activated, they increase proliferation. Uh, they, they divide and multiply. And they're transformed to an ac active phenotype. They, they become alpha smooth muscle actin positive, And they exhibit increased synthesis and secretion of extracellular matrix protein. Now, pancreatic stellate cells now, let's move on, were first described by this gentleman here, Ikejiri, in, in the pancreas in 1990. Ikejiri. And he said that they're, they're wrapped around the asini, they have prominent lipid droplets, and they have positive vitamin A fluorescence, 1990. And here's some of our work, which, which you published in Gut in 1998, showing on the left here a, a section of liver with these, you can see the, nicely see the star-shaped uh, nature of these cells in amongst the, the, the uh, hepatocytes. And this is a stain for Desmond, which I've said is a stellate cell selective marker. Here's a corresponding section of the, the pancreas with the cells draped around a pancreatic asinus here, staining again for Desmond. They also, they also occur around pancreatic ducts, around pancreatic blood vessels, uh, and they also are found around pancreatic islets. This is important. It's not the subject of my talk this afternoon, but there's increased evidence of fibrosis and stellate cell accumulation in diabetes. And it's been shown that pancreatic stellate cell secretions can actually inhibit the, secre the, se the secretion of insulin by islet by, uh, cells. Now, how do we isolate them? It's not that hard, really, if, you know, if you've done it. Um, for normal pancreatic stellate cells, those that are normal in a normal gland, we make use of the fact that they've got vitamin A in them, vitamin A droplets, which are fatty droplets, and so they float on water or something that's less, they're more dense than them. Or in activated pancreatic stellate cells, we use an outgrowth method. In other words, we cut out a piece of pancreas, we put it on a dish, and the cells that are already activated swim away. And so they, they divide and multiply just on, in a plastic dish. Here's our... Um, our density gradient centrifugation method, simply we, we, this is good for both humans and for, for rats, for rodents. We digest the pancreas, we get a suspension of single cells, and we use nicodens, which is a, um, or a nicodens gradient, which is just a substance that actually has varying densities. And we find that the stellate cells rest here um, just below the aqueous phase, but on top of the, a more dense, slower phase. So that's how we, how we get them. Freshly isolated, they're round, and um, they contain um, desmond, as I've said before. And then in culture, early in culture, this is an EM of cells in culture, early on they've got a polygonal shape, and they, they contain these fat droplets, which contain vitamin A. All right. And here's one of our favorite photos of the showing beautifully the intracellular arrangement of the fine Desmond fibrils within a stellate cell. This is the, the nucleus here and the cytoskeletal protein Desmond here and here. 
Again, this is a bit repetitive, just so that you've, you've focused. You've seen this slide before. This is the stellate cell stain positive for Desmond in the acinus. Um, isolated cells stain positive for Desmond and for, G, for GFAP, which is glial fibrillary acidic protein, another cytoskeletal protein. And they also stain positive for NEST and NCAM and NGF, which are just markers, stellate cell markers. And in culture, they exhibit um, a polygonal shape with vitamin A droplets around them. When they're active, when you get stellate cells out of a gland, they're quiet. They're been asleep, they're resting quietly. And then you put them onto a plastic dish and they wake up and they become activated. They start walking and talking and dividing and multiplying. Not talking, exactly. Um, so after 48 hours, they stain positive for something, stain positive for something called uh, alpha smooth muscle actin. And this is, not a, this is not unique for stellate cells. Any myofibroblast has alpha actin but it's a sign of activity in stellate cells. And these cells function in life to secrete extracellular matrix proteins. So collagen, collagen three, collagen one, laminin, fibronectin are just a few of the proteins that they synthesize and secrete. They constitute about 4 to 7 percent of the entire pancreatic uh, parenchymal cell mass. They're located in the vasolateral region. I said this morning, and I say it again, these pointers that are actually designed to do five functions were never designed by a person who has to give lectures. Um, nonetheless, they're resident cells of the pancreas. They're located around the acini. They have vitamin A droplets. They express stellate cell selective markers. And their function in health is to maintain normal ECM turnover by synthesizing matrix proteins and matrix degrading enzymes. Now, how do, what do they do in health? In health, the extracellular matrix is very important in every, every organ. Um, and there's a balance between synthesis and degradation that's pretty well even. And the synthesis involves the synthesis of collagens, fibronectin, and laminin. Degradation involves um, secretion of things we call matrix metalloproteinases, which actually sort of gobble up and chew up the extracellular matrix proteins. And the system is further regulated by TIBs, which are tissue inhibitors of these MMPs. So it's a complex system, but it's designed to maintain homeostasis. What else do they do in health? Well, uh, we and others, but particularly others from Japan, have actually shown that they have an innate immune function. They express uh, toll-like receptors, two, three, four, and five. These are all part of the innate immune response. They're capable of endocytosis and they're capable of uh, phagocytosis of necrotic acinar cells. They don't appear to have a role in acquired immunity. They don't function as antigen-presenting cells in the pancreas, although there's some evidence that they do function in this role in the liver. Um, and they, act, they can act as progenitor cells. In other words, they can play a role in pancreatic regeneration. Now, this paper was published about four years ago now, um, in PLOS One, uh, by a group that took stellate cells, pancreatic stellate cells, from a rat, put individual cells in dishes, and grew them up. In other words, they clonally, clonally expanded the pancreatic stellate cells. And they found that the stellate cells had a number of stem cell markers that I've listed there on the slide. And that they could transplant these cells from the dish into um, a, um, 
a female uh, rat that had had um, a partial hepatectomy. So these cells they found could actually aid liver regeneration. These are pancreatic stellate cells, but they're aiding liver regeneration. And how did they know that? Well, they used a uh, they used female rats and injected into them these clonally expanded stellate cells from males. So the stellate cells from males actually had Y chromosomes that they could stain for. And they found in the host liver, female host liver, they could find these white dots here, which are supposed to be green, but there's white. They could find evidence of Y chromosomes suggesting that the stellate cells had actually migrated to the liver and were helping in the regeneration of the liver back to normal. These cells in health also seem to play a role in pancreatic secretion, exocrine secretion. This is work that we've done and we were struck by the fact that these cells seem to be so close to the base of the acinous cells. This is a, an acidus. And we wondered whether they played a role in helping the acinous cells secrete. Um, we were further motivated by the, the traditional belief about uh, the way in which when you eat a meal, the pancreas secretes, is that if you eat a meal, it goes into your duodenum CCK is released and CCK acts on receptors of the acinar cells and therefore you get secretion. That's okay in the rat, but it's not, it wasn't entirely clear when we were doing this study and still not whether humans actually have the same mechanism. In other words, I think to this day, CCK receptors in human acinar cells have been hard to identify. So we asked whether um, pancreatic secretion could be mediated via acetylcholine released from these cells. Uh, so the CCK actually stimulated these cells rather than acinar cells. And the, and the stellate cells, having been activated by CCK, could then release acetylcholine and stimulate pancreatic secretion. Now, this is the traditional view about how CCK um, activates pancreatic secretion. CCK is released, and it's believed to act, in humans anyway, via intrapancreatic neurons. Remember, humans, human acinar cells don't have CCK receptors, but they have acetylcholine receptors. So CCK acts on intrapancreatic neurons. It releases acetylcholine, and stimulates pancreatic acid in cells, giving in enzyme secretion. Okay. Now, we wondered whether stellate cells could be part of this makeup, or maybe even the dominant feature, the dominant way in which stellate, uh, with these cells are actually, CCK can actually stimulate acid cells. And we wondered then whether uh, pancreatic stellate cells contained receptors, CCK receptors, so that CCK could act directly on them. And what did we find? Well, we took acid cells and we put them in a bowl or a test tube. And we, we either incubated them with or without atropin. Atropin was there to block acetylcholine or block the acetylcholine receptor. So here we have these acid cells. And over here we have a dish containing stellate cells. And we added stellate cells and we added neostigmine to the stellate cells. Neostigmine is a cholinesterase inhibitor and it, it prevents breakdown of any acetylcholine release. So here we have acinar cells, stellate cells. And we put the acinar cells on top of the stellate cells, and what do we find? Well, we, then we measured acinar cell secretion by measuring amylase released into the medium. And we found that stellate cells stimulated acinar cell amylase secretion. And this effect was blocked by atropin, which blocked acetylcholine receptors, cholinergic receptors on the uh, acinar cells. 
So this is the, if you like, the traditional paradigm. We've, we've shown that pancreatic stellate cells can release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and um, stimulate acinous cells. Okay. This work took 10 years to complete from the idea that we had. And part of the delay was actually being able to measure acetylcholine. You, you read a textbook or any sort of book of neurology and you read about acetylcholine, it must be simple to measure. It's not. It's horribly difficult. And we had to find a group that had uh, experience in GC mass spec, mass spec, to actually help us measure acetylcholine. So from beginning to end, it took us 10 years to actually complete this project and publish it in PNAS. Now, the next question we ask is, do, do pancreatic stellate cells have CCK receptors? And they do. Human stellate cells predominantly have the CCKA receptor. Um, rat pancreatic stellate cells predominantly have the CCKB receptor. And here we've, we've identified them by um, Western blotting on the left and by immunostaining on the right. Stellate cells stain for the CCKA and B receptors. So when we actually measured acetylcholine, being released, we, we stimulated the stellate cells with CCK8, which is an analogue of CCK, and found that if we used a CCKA antagonist, we could actually inhibit acetylcholine secretion. So, to cut a long story short, pancreatic stellate cells secrete acetylcholine, which stimulate acinous cells, and CCK. We've shown that CCK can directly activate pancreatic stellate cells uh, and cause them to release acetylcholine. So we published this in PNAS a couple of years ago, and it may be the, the dominant mechanism whereby pancreatic secretion is able to be effective. Now that's not much, that does, that's, doesn't mean much to clinicians, or maybe even to medical students, but it, that's an important step uh, in terms of understanding pancreatic biology. Now, we turned our, we, we, we then followed two lines of research. We were interested in the role of pancreatic stellate cells in pancreatic cancer, sorry, in pancreatitis, but just for the sake of brevity and just getting through this afternoon, I've left the pancreatitis slides out. I just want to tell you about our, how our thoughts are emerging about the role of these cells in pancreatic cancer and how by tackling these cells, we may be able to come up with no, novel therapeutic strategies to defeat pancreatic cancer. Um, now, as I said, pancreatic cancer has this desmoplastic reaction, dense uh, tissues uh, which, contain, which contain stellate cells, the ECM proteins, also contains immune cells, endothelial cells, and neural elements. Anybody know what the... Uh, the incidence and the prevalence of pancreatic cancer is? Well, one thing's important. The incidence equals the prevalence. In other words, you don't last more than a year if you have the disease. That's one thing. Secondly is, I'm not quite sure about the incidence. It's not the commonest cancer in the world, but by 2020, it's estimated it'll be the commonest cause of cancer death in Western societies anyway. The commonest cause of cancer death. A researcher from the United States told me, he gave me this analogy. You, you have a, if you have, if you're condemned to death in Texas, in the United States, where they kill a lot of prisoners, if you're condemned to death, how long do you last? How long before death comes? The judge says, I'm going to send you off for a lethal injection. How long do you survive? About three years, because there are lots of court cases and appeals and stuff like that. With pancreatic cancer, it's worse. You don't survive six months. And even with, even with, you know, a whole variety of chemotherapeutic agents that we have at our disposal today, 
how long do you think all that, that chemotherapy increases survival? At the most, six weeks. Anybody who's an oncologist in the audience? That's good. Oncologists hate that. And oncologists sort of, because of the nature of their work, have to remain optimistic. So they do all these trials and add little inches and millimetres to people's lives. But six weeks on the, in, the, in the scheme of things isn't that much. It's a horrible disease. And part of the reason the chemotherapy doesn't work might be that we've been concentrating on the wrong cells or concentrating only on these cancer cell elements here rather than on these cells in the, in the interstitium, the, the stellate cells. So you can turn on stellate cells by a variety of mechanisms to activate them. Um, and when they're activated, they lose their vitamin A. Nobody knows why they lose their vitamin A, but if you, if you give them vitamin A back and make them eat vitamin A again, they go to sleep again. So they become activated, they express alpha-actin, they proliferate, they divide and multiply, they migrate, they become motile, they increase their ECM protein, so they're activated. And there are a myriad of ways in which you can activate them. Almost you can just say good morning to them and they activate. Um, importantly, because we're interested in alcoholic pancreatitis as well, alcohol as metabolites can activate the stellate cells, oxidant stress can, but a variety of other molecules have been identified. Increased pressure in the pancreas, which is believed to go up when you have chronic pancreatitis, that can elevate them. <coughs> Hyperglycemia uh, of diabetes can actually elevate them as well, activate them as well. And, once, and, and when you activate stellate cells, you activate numerous intracellular signaling pathways. And you don't have to know this, you just have to know there are very many. And, and almost every day, an additional sort of uh, signaling pathway is identified. I put these two down the bottom here, PPAR gamma, gamma and the vitamin D receptor ligand in green because when you, when you actually um, uh, stimulate them with PPAR gamma or with vitamin D, they become quiescent. So it's a mechanism whereby you can actually make them less active. Now, I said that the stroma, the, the desmoplastic reaction may be important in the way in which a, a cancer behaves. Therefore, you'd think if there's more stroma, um, is it good or bad? Um, and we, and the answer is, so people have looked at stroma around pancreatic cancer, and the results are inconclusive. So from the studies that I've listed here, we don't need to go through them. Um, some people say stroma is bad. Some people say it's good. And the reason I think there's such a variety in the, in the, in the actual findings depends upon, um, I guess, the way in which studies are designed. And also, I think that it ignores the fact that stroma is not homogeneously one thing or the other. Stroma at the, its center around the, st uh, the cancer cells traditionally very dense and it, it generates an hypoxic, a hypoxic environment whereas at the cutting edge of the ca cancer, right out there where the cancer is actually locally invading, um, the stellate cells are very active and there's a lot of new blood vessel formation that may be actually propagating the cancer. So it's hard just from these studies that are taken from resected specimens of patients who died of pancreatic cancer to conclude whether the, the stroma is good or bad. So if you take the stroma and you do serial sections, like slice it, then slice it again and put different stain, stains on, you find that uh, there's lots of collagen. Sorry, it's red stains for collagen. And there's lots of alpha-actin suggesting that there are stellate cells in these um, 
sections. And again, serial sections, alpha actin here. We know about alpha actin, active stellate cells, and here Desmond, a stellate cell specific marker, selective marker. So in pancreatic cancer, again, we we stain for alpha actin and we dual stain for collagen using in situ hybridization. These cells, these alpha actin cells that are a predominant source of collagen in the, in the desmoplastic reaction. And amazingly, it's just not in cancer. In tannin lesions, which are believed to be the precursor of pancreatic cancer in pancreatic ducts, in the ductal system, very early on, they are surrounded by stellate cells. And also in genetically modified mice that have um, pannins that go on to develop cancer, they also have these alpha actin positive cells. So, what's the relationship between pancreatic stellate cells and pancreatic cancer cells? Pancreatic cancer cells on the left. These summarise, these next couple of slides will just summarise all our work in the field because we believe that pancreatic stellate cells are not good for pancreatic cancer. So pancreatic cancer cells stimulate pancreatic stellate cells. They proliferate, they produce more ECM and they migrate. On the other hand, stellate cells influence cancer cells. They make them proliferate. They decrease their rate of apoptosis. In other words, they increase their survival. They increase their migration. And they also create a stem cell niche for pancreatic cancer cells, making them more malignant. Now, our work has been in animals. It's part of preclinical work to try and work up therapy for pancreatic cancer. We devised new therapy involves nude mice, immunodeficient mice. The, the tail of the pancreas is injected with a variety of things, human stellate cells, human pancreatic cancer cells, or a combination of human pancreatic cancer cells and stellate cells. So this is our model here, really. The rest are controls. And we've looked at tumor growth and metastasis. Now, if you inject just cancer cells into the pancreas, you'll get a tumor. If you inject with uh, pancreatic stellate cells, you'll get a bigger tumour. And the, bigger, the, the size of the tumour is not only because there are stellate cells there, but it's because the cancer cells proliferate more rapidly. Same with another cancer cell line. So bigger cells, sorry, bigger tumours, and most importantly, more METs. Add stellate cells, you get more metastases. And this is just a slide showing how our, our, our model is relevant to the human situation. Because when we've got the, the two cell types combined, we get cancer cells together with broad bands of fibrous tissue. Whereas the cancer cells by themselves just get cancer cells. This is more like the human disease. Um, so when we looked at um, cell proliferation, we found that cancer, uh, stellate cells um, made, the, made the cancer cells proliferate more and optose, uh, sorry, apoptose less. So in other words, increase their survival. <coughs> Not all stellate cells are the same. There are patients that have been described with subset of, of stellate cells that are positive for one marker or the other. This is work from a Japanese group looking at a, a molecule called CD10, which is a surface metalloproteinase. And when, it's, when patients manifest uh, CT, CD10 positivity, they have a decrease, this is human studies, decreased survival. Okay. So I mentioned metastasis. How does metastasis happen? Well, you've got a cancer cell that sits there, you know, joined up with other cancer cells, looking like, you know, a tumour. 
to, to actually get out of the pancreas, the cells have to sort of shake themselves free of their neighbours, migrate to the nearest blood vessel or lymph vessel. They then have to get into the lymph vessel or blood vessel. They have to be transported through the circulation. And then after, when they get to where they want to get off, like the liver or the brain or whatever, they have to sort of cut through the endothelial barrier and get out. Cancer cells by themselves um, are not that great at swimming or shimming around. But, when they be, they, but they can be transformed by a process called EMP, which is epithelial mesenchymal transition. So they become more like, um, more like stellate cells, actually. They, they actually become elongated, they become motile, and they lose their markers of, um, of uh, epithelial cells. So, oops. So, e cadherin, CK19, are markers of epithelial cells with um, EMT, epithelial uh, mesenchymal transition. They lose these markers and they develop mes mesenchymal markers, vermentin and snail 1. Uh, are two of the markers. So s that's how cancer cells, when influenced by pancreatic stellate cells, become a little bit more feral or are able to swim out of the pancreas and to metastatic sites. We asked, did, did we know? We asked, wouldn't it be intriguing if stellate cells travelled with the cancer cells to distant metastatic sites? That would be a, a shift. People at this stage, when we did this sort of work, knew that cancer cells travelled in clusters um, through the circulation, but they didn't. Nobody, nobody knows, and nobody knows now whether they travelled together with stellate cells. So, what did we do to see if we could? So, we took a female cancer cell line, a female cancer cell line, and we added to it male pancreatic stellate cells and injected it into female nude mice. So female mice but with male cancer, male pancreatic stellate cells. And then we looked at, at our metastases in our model to see if we could find the Y chromosome by, uh, by a very difficult uh, technique called fluorescent in situ hybridization fish. And what do we find? This is bad because fish actually get fish to work, you've practically got to destroy the background histology of the cells. But the, the blue stain is for essentially a nuclei and um, uh, these are metastases that we've actually sectioned and stained for the Y chromosome. And we found, it's very difficult to see this elimination, we found the Y chromosome in the liver in the di diaphragm and in the mediastinum. So stellate cells apparently do travel with, with cancer cells to metastatic sites and they may, once they get there, sort of create you know, a little bit of a, a bed for them to rest and they may attract other cells, other stellate cells from, from the host organ, from the host organ to actually come and make up the desmoplastic reaction. We're still we're, we're currently engaged as we speak with a, um, a circulating tumour cell machine. There are machines now that can actually measure cancer cells as they go through um, the blood. And if you actually sort of take cells either from the peripheral blood or from the portal vein from people with pancreatic cancer, there are thousands of them. And you think, well, if, if they sort of all were going to be nasty, the patient would die in a matter of nanoseconds. It wouldn't take six months. They'd be dead because they'd be, their body would just be full of metastases. So there must be something that actually selects out those cells that are going to form metastases. And we believe our hypothesis is that it's the stellate cells that actually do that, the travelling with them. And we're doing research along that line as we speak. So what else do uh, stellate cells do? They promote blood vessel growth within a tumour. And so the more vascular the tumour, the more likely it is to actually spread and metastasize. 
this, this is stain for CD31, which is a endothelial cell marker. And you see that when a cancer cell is associated with a stellate cell population, you get much more blood vessel formation. And when you take endothelial cells and put them in a dish, and then you expose them to secretions from, from the st stellate cells, you find that they form stellate, oh, sorry. Stellate cells form tubes, tube formation, just like blood vessels. You need immunity to help you suppress cancer growth and metastasis. There's evidence that stellate cells suppress the, immune the local immune response to cancer cells. Stellate cells can secrete substances. I've just named them here. No interest to you, but they're, they're their names. They can act on the T cell, make the T cells apoptose and impair the immune response. Mast cells are a form of immune cell. Stellate cells can activate mast cells, and the mast cell secretions, IL-3 and tryptase, promote cancer cells, cancer cell and PSC proliferation. They can act on the nerves in the pancreas. This is a study, don't worry about the diagram, the sort of the pictures on the left, but uh, these researchers looked at neural elements, stellate cells and pancreatic cells that were transfected with sonic hedgehog, which is a which is a uh, intracellular signaling sort of pathway, and found that those cancer cells transfected with sonic hedgehog and, and with pancreatic stellate cells acted on the neural elements to stimulate neurite, out, neurite outgrowth. In other words, they proliferated. They started to grow their tentacles out. And neural elements are believed to be important not only in the pathogenesis of pain for, for chronic pancreatitis, but also they're probably a way in which pancreatic cancer spreads locally along neural machines. This is a summary slide, basically saying you've got activated pancreatic stellate cells here, which do all the things I've already said to you, and they interact with cancer cells uh, to make the cancer cells more malignant. They can act on immune cells, decreasing T cell activity, mast cell activation. They can act on endothelial cells, promoting blood vessel formation. And they can act on neurons, making the neurons elongate. So, summary slide again. The stellate cells induce EMT epithelial um, mesenchymal uh, transition in cancer cells. They stimulate angiogenesis. They facilitate immune evasion. They play a role in chemo resistance and radio resistance. I didn't actually sort of, I haven't dwelt on this, but there is evidence that chemotherapy is more difficult and, uh, when you've got stellate cells and fibrosis around, as is radiotherapy. And they induce stemness of cancer cells, which again, we, we haven't dwelt on too much. All right, so having said that, let's, uh, what, have we, what have we found in terms of targeting the stroma? Does it make a difference? So if you just not only try and kill the cancer cells, but if you try and target the stromal cells, will that make a difference? And that's where, I know I've been building you up to a fever-pitched excitement, that's where you have to go, oh, that's, we're not there yet. So. On this, we have a number of uh, ways in which you can inhibit killed cancer cells and inhibit the stroma down here. And we've got preclinical studies, all of which seem to show promise. You get decrease in stroma and you get decrease in tumor growth and metastasis. But in terms of clinical trials, the slam dunk isn't there. Um, the cl clinical trials have been either partially successful or not, not successful at all. And there are phase one trials that are going on uh, utilizing vitamin D analogs and also this, this substance called minilide, 
which is a heat shock protein inhibitor in phase trials. So we're not there, but I hope I've actually shown you how we've actually, by our work with, with, uh, with preclinical models, at least taken the thinking to where the next sort of uh, chemotherapeutic attack should be on established pancreatic cancer. Um, I just want to uh, mention just a little bit of our own current work. We're interested in a patocyte growth factor, which is a growth factor that's been implicated in a number of cancers, including pancreatic cancer. It regulates proliferation and migration in motion, so it's thought to be important. And it can interact with VEGF, which is an angiogenic factor, um, and uh, uh, stimulate angiogenesis. Yeah. The HGF part, HGF is only secreted by uh, mesenchymal cells. Cancer cells don't have HGF, but they have the receptor for HGF, which is called CMET. So we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could actually inhibit both the HGF secreted by the cancer cells, by, um, sorry, by the stellate cells, with an HGF inhibitor, an inhibiting antibody, and used a CMET inhibitor to inhibit the receptor on stellate cells to see what happens to survival. And for, for this particular set of experiments, we used up to a triple therapy. In other words, we gave them gemcitabine, which is a standard chemotherapeutic agent, plus the HGF antibody, plus the CMET inhibitor, and we found that um, there was a marked defect, sorry, a marked um, inhibition of tumor volume with the triple therapy. And we almost entirely obliterated triple therapy with triple therapy metastasis. So with all three treatments, we almost wiped metastasis out. So this combination now has to be tested in uh, vivo to see if it works in a clinical trial in prolonging survival. So I think this, I'm coming close to the end. This is my takes a village type picture. The, the environment around in pancreatic cancer is complex. There are tumor cells, there are stellate cells, there are blood vessels, there's ECM proteins, there are T cells and so on. And they all interact and we have to come up with ways of actually interfering with each of these elements in addition to killing the tumor cells to see whether we can make a difference in pancreatic cancer. So we've got to actually sort of think for multiple targets, not just think about chemotherapy for pancreatic cancer. Um, before I finish up, um, some people this morning um, this is the way we normally approach pancreatic cancer and its control. I said by 2020, it'll be the leading cause of cancer death in the Western world, 2020. It's a big problem. And part of the problem is by the time you diagnose pancreatic cancer, it's already well established. Part of the reason is that you know, a tumor can sit in the body of the pancreas or the tail and be silent. Often your only chance of survival these days if you get pancreatic cancer, if you get a tumor in the head which blocks off the bile duct and you become jaundice. Then you've got a bit of a chance, but not much. You, you, they, they quote five years survival of about 20% of people who have Whipple's, but in reality it's much lower than that. So um, the question arose about whether the way to go is by early detection. In other words, screening. And we're looking, people are looking all over the world for a magic marker, a molecule using proteomics and a variety of techniques that it can, will actually, they can identify and say, and then investigate people. But for mass screening, the, the, the approach has to be sort of cost effective. Um, some of you may or may not know that a lot of patients who develop pancreatic cancer clinically in the preceding months have presented with type 2 diabetes. 
as a sort of a harbinger of disease. So do we investigate everybody with recent onset type 2 diabetes uh, for pancreatic cancer? And the answer is no, because it's not cost effective. And the only way you can investigate them is by doing a CT scan. And it's, um, it, it just wouldn't work cost effectively. There are mechanisms to explain how cancer cells can inhibit insulin secretion by the islets and therefore cause uh, type 2 diabetes. But nonetheless, it's not there. Do we develop a screening test, an imaging test? Again, I think it'd be too expensive. Uh, certainly, people have actually developed nuclear medicine tests for actually sort of highlighting the stroma and having it light up on a, on a, on a sort of under a, a gamma camera. But again, not much, not probably impractical for a screening test. So what we're left with now is people getting advanced pancreatic cancer and dying. And what I've suggested to you this afternoon is that this is the way I think we, we have to tackle that group of patients. They've already got cancer. Uh, they're going to die in a short order in six months without treatment, without treatment or with treatment that just doesn't work. If we make the treatment more effective, we could actually limit the extent and the progression of the disease. But don't forget that the early detection and screening is, the most, is, is a very important element. But nonetheless, it's a, a long way away. I just want to conclude by acknowledging the members of my group. Professor Minoti Apti, who's the director of the group now, um, there's me and a whole lot of professors there who dri drive the research and a whole lot of um, PhD students and um, undergraduate students that actually help us with our, uh, our work. So thank you. You've been ominously silent. And as far as I can tell, everybody in the room is still awake, so I think that's good. But um, I'm happy to take questions now because I'm ahead of time. Thank you. <laughs> and these are our, our collaborators internationally and, and locally. Sorry? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I only you talk not non-alcoholic thing. Yeah, I look. I, I the first paper I ever published was back in I think 1982, which the title of it was "Alcohol Causes a Fatty Pancreas." But the fat I was talking about was intracellular fat that you couldn't see on light microscopy. Uh, you could only see it on EM. When people describe fatty pancreas today in the alcoholic or not, they're, they're actually describing an increase in the interstitial fat in the pancreas. So they get sort of neutral fat. And it's, it's common in humans anyway. But the, and it's probably associated with obesity that uh, you get a fatty pancreas. A long time ago, I, did, I was doing some research into alcoholic pancreatitis, and I had to go to the morgue to get pancreases from people who had been killed in car accidents. They say, and, you, and then you, what we wanted to do was homogenize them and, and work out their fat content. But this interstitial fat got in the way so badly, we had to abandon the project. These were even in young people. So humans have a lot of fat in and around their pancreas. And it sort of it fills the pancreas up when there's pancreatic atrophy. Your pancreas gets smaller when you get older. And I think that's part of the phenomenon. When they talk about alcoholic fatty pancreas, 